And as the children make their way to the back, if you would take your Bible and turn to the Old Testament book of Psalms, we're going to look at Psalm 58. Psalm 58. So we're taking a break from our Romans um, theme and uh, Romans study to think about the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And so I want us to think about this psalm in light of that, these 11 verses, reading from the English Standard Version, Psalm 58, verse 1. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No. In your heart you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his blood, his feet, in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that we can come now to this psalm penned so many thousands of years ago, yet so applicable for us in 2024. What a joy it is to have your word fresh to us this morning. Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear, help us to understand and apply as we absorb what is written here, and may you work in our hearts and our minds for a newfound obedience. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I just introduced just a moment ago that this is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, celebrated by churches all across the nation. And so certainly we want to take an opportunity this morning to do that. We want to begin the sermon time with just a little bit of a video. It's about two and a half minutes long. And this is a uh, video um, that is produced by Rafa, the crisis pregnancy center that we support that is uh, located in Emory, uh, in Greenville, rather. And so you watch this, and then we'll get into our text and the rest of the sermon. Created for purpose, a unique genetic blueprint from the moment of conception. DNA woven together to determine gender, eye color, hair color, fearfully and wonderfully made. Value beyond measure. Our culture says life is disposable, her rights matter most, but it's not really a baby. And it's all one big choice. But God created us in his own image and whispered. I have called you by name. You are mine. In the U.S., Roe v. Wade has been overturned, but abortion is still illegal in many states. Most recently, abortion has been boxed up in the form of two little pills and a promise to make it all go away. What will you do to make a difference to life? How can you be a voice? Will you help save a life? There are over 2,700 pregnancy centers in the United States, serving men and women free of charge and full of hope, providing pregnancy tests, life-affirming counsel, abortion recovery, classes, clothing, and diapers. Many centers offer the first glimpse of a woman's baby in the womb displaying the magnificence of creation and the precious seats of a tiny heart, perfectly formed and fashioned by the one who created them. They serve faithfully, love well, encourage, they 
their help dealers. They need volunteers, your prayers, and your financial support. Will you please give generously and help make a difference for life today? We've been supporting Rafa for a lot of years, and I don't know if you realize this, but uh, Deidre McGinn, uh, who's a member of our congregation, um, volunteers there uh, weekly. And so if you have questions about how you might want to be involved, you can see Deidre, and she'll be glad to share that information with you. Um, also, uh, Karen Seaman uh, does a lot of work for our congregation with Rafa, and if you have questions, you can talk with Karen, and she can fill you in on some of the details regarding what upcoming events and opportunities with Rafa. But I just wanted you to see that video because it sets the stage for what we want to think about this morning. And we want to look at this psalm, uh, which is a, um, a psalm perhaps that uh, you haven't ever given much thought to, especially in regard to uh, the sanctity of human life. But we live in a culture, of course, that you know that is confused uh, at best. And as worse, is deliberately, um, intentionally rebelling against God. And one of the ways that this nation has rebelled against God is in 1973 when the Supreme Court issued a decision, Roe versus Wade, that legalized abortion on demand all across the country. And so it's been legal since that date until... June of 2022. Now, in between 1973 and 2022, that's an estimated, in this nation alone, 63 million babies aborted. Now, we're talking about abortion in which the abortion has been chosen because it's inconvenient for the mother or because of circumstances in which there were... um, things that she didn't want, Uh, her body would change. There would be financial obligations. Uh, There would be uh, those seemingly um, reasons that would not be compatible with having an abortion done. And so that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. We're not talking about medically uh, provided um, a loss of a baby in a medical situation with no doubt those kinds of things happen when everything has been done to save the life of that baby, when all resources are exhausted to save the life of that baby, and it cannot be done for the sake of the mother. We understand that. Um, But what we want to think about is the fact that even though in June of 2022, uh, the Supreme Court reversed their previous decision from 1973 that really had stood for 50 years, uh, that there is still abortion on demand all across the nation. It can sti- you can still go and have an abortion. Uh, as the video alluded to, most, over half of the abortions now are not done clinically, but they are done medically uh, through the mail. You order your medication that will cause the abortion, and a woman takes that medication in the privacy of her home, and uh, abortion is the result of that. So most abortions that we see that are done medically or in the clinic would be chosen for social reasons, would be uh, reasons uh, that uh, would be, again, inconsistent uh, with taking the life of one that has been created in the image of God. It's serious. Uh, There's a lot of controversy. I recognize that. I know it's a delicate situation. I know that there are women who, even perhaps in this auditorium, who um, abortion has been part of their life. So this is not a condemnation. In fact, we want to show great compassion, and we'll see that as we work through some of the text. But I do want to work through some of this text because I think it helps us in a year, in an election year, when decisions must be made in regard to uh, morality 
And if this nation is going to yet survive, uh, we need to listen carefully to what's being said, and we need to vote biblically. And I'm not necessarily saying one party or another. You read the national party platforms. Just read them. That'll tell you who you need to vote for, how you need to vote. But if you don't do that, think about it from Psalm 58, because here we have a psalm that focuses on the judgment of God on human leaders who continue to oppress people who continue to rebel against what is against conscience, and against the very Word of God. So this is a psalm that is focused on a a, a righteous anger. It's a lamentation, if you will, which is a, a mourning, a grief, a complaint toward corrupt, deceitful rulers who rule with wicked injustice. It is a prayer that is put to song, I would I would. I think that we could say that and be comfortable with that. It's a prayer that has been put to a song. It's it's a song because we see in the subheading the the mitkan that is is according to the the choir master. And so this is something that we want to work through. and, And there's two points that I bring to our attention. It's really divided up nicely for us in that first we see the cry of indictment against evil rulers, the cry of indictment. Now, an indictment is a charge of accusation. So we see this cry of indictment in verses 1 through 5. And then, in the last part of the psalm, we see in verses 6 through 11, this cry of imprecation. imprecation. And an imprecation or imprecatory is the idea of a spoken curse. And so when we read these words in the last part of this psalm, and you think, what is going on here? Is David crying out that these who would be evil rulers would be dissolved as a snail into slime? How do we think about that? And so let's work through this together and see how it can apply to our thinking on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. So in the first verse, David sets the tone of the psalm. It's a very serious accusation that is coming against these rulers. It's not clear really as to the background of the psalm, when David might have wrote it, to who he was writing about, but certainly the indictment that he's making here is applicable to all evil rulers in all centuries, in all times. And the indictment comes in the form of two questions. You see that in verse 1. Here's the first question. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? And notice the little g in the English Standard Version. That is, gods are understood to be human rulers, human political leaders, those who govern the affairs of men, who have been put in those places that they might rule rightly. Do you indeed decree what is right? Do you make laws that are right? Do you make commands that are right? And notice the second question in verse 1. Do you judge the children of man uprightly? Do you with certainty and with honesty and with righteousness and fairness, if you would, do you judge, do you rule, do you serve the children of man, that is the people in your charge, do you do that rightly, uprightly? Do you do it justly? This is the charges that are made against these evil rulers. Now look at the answer in verse 2. No. No, you don't. No, you do not judge rightly. No, you do not do and decree what is good for the people that you have jurisdiction over. No, you don't. You don't devise what is good, but rather rather you devise wrongs. You don't do it rightly. You do it wrongly. Your hands deal out violence on the earth. You're not doing 
what you are charged to do under the Lord God, whom all government leaders must give an account. Listen, government has a sphere, and they can't step out of that sphere. They can't tell the church what to do. The, the government has a sphere of influence and responsibility that they are accountable to God to do, and it is not to do violence to the people that they are given charge to protect and to serve. And this is the, this is the sermon, or rather this is the indictment, that you evil rulers do not do the things that you're to, supposed to do under God. And how should we expect that? Look, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. These evil rulers who God has put in place through the mechanisms of government, these wicked rulers are estranged from the womb. That is, they're estranged from God. They're estranged from righteousness. They were born in sin. They were conceived as sinners. They come out of the womb as sinners. The Bible is clear. At the moment of conception, you are guilty before Him. We are sinners by nature. And so these wicked rulers certainly would have been estranged from God, from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. Now David doesn't exclude himself from this. We can read that in Psalm 51. He says, in sin, my mother conceived me. He doesn't mean that it was a sinful act in which he was conceived. He means that from the moment he was conceived, he was a sinner who needed the grace of God to save him from God's wrath. These wicked rulers are people who need the grace of God through the gospel of Christ. And notice that the first thing that David writes about is their mouth. They speak lies. Because that's a lot what wicked politicians do. You can't trust what's said. You can't trust what is written. You can't trust what you view. Because so much of the time it seems that it's nothing but lies. Look, they have, there was four, the venom that is like the venom of a serpent. In other words, it's poisonous. It's deadly. And these wicked rulers, these political leaders, they're like the deaf cobra or adder that stops its ear. They refuse to listen to reason. They have no desire to listen to reason or logic. They listen to those who would agree with them. And so they stop their ears, even as a, a cobra might stop its ears against the voice of a charmer, against an enchanter. And you've seen those pictures of the horn being played and the pipe being played while a cobra rises and sways back and forth. This is an illustration that wicked rulers who do not do what is right, they do not decree what is right, they do not judge uprightly, they refuse to listen to logic, they refuse to listen to even the Word of God. They have no shame in what they do. They reject anything that God would say. They're evil. And it's been true from all time that evil men would rule in such a way that they would do violence to their own people. That they would take advantage, that they would use them. That they would cut against them for their own purposes, their own plans, and desire. And that's to be expected because men have wicked hearts. This is why the necessity of the gospel So David's focus here on these verses portray the hearts of these evil leaders. They plan, they accomplish, they promote, they encourage, 
violence, and they will not listen to reason. So what do we do? I mean, how are we supposed to do this? think about this? If evildoers are put in place by God, and yet they, the evildoers, do not judge uprightly, they don't decree what is right, then what are the people of God supposed to do? What are the people that they have jurisdiction supposed to do? Well, these next verses give us some indication of that. And these are the imprecatory words here. That is this spoken curse. And there are several psalms that are titled imprecatory psalms, uh, just like there are traveling psalms or psalms of ascent that we find in the psalms. Uh, the psalms. We find um, psalms of encouragement and enthronement. So there's different variety of psalms, and this is considered an imprecatory psalm. This is one who is a person of God who cries out for God's justice. He's not crying out for a vengeance for himself. He's not asking for some kind of revenge, but he's crying out in an um, emotional way that God would intervene, that there would be something that God would do Because that's really going to be the only way that these men would be brought to justice. That would be the only way that people could live in righteousness and truth and in peace. And so notice what he says in his prayer. It has become a song. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. He goes right to the place where he knows that they do the worst of their work. They lie. They deceive. They manipulate. They use. They take advantage by their words. And so the prayer is, God, bust them in the chops. Do what you have to do to remove the words from their mouth and tear out their veins. They're like young lions. Young lions are aggressive. So God, you be aggressive against these aggressive, evil political leaders. You tear out their veins. veins. Do what is necessary that they might receive the due justice that they deserve, that they earned themselves because they acted in such violent and wicked ways against the decrees of God and against God's people. Innocent victims. Notice verse 7. Let them vanish like water that runs away. Cause their life to be totally forgotten. It would be like pouring water out on a dry and parched ground and it's just soaked in and you don't even see the trace of it any longer. That's what David is praying against these political leaders. He wants this to happen in God's time, in God's way. He's not seeking in any way to take vengeance by himself. He's not looking to go do anything that would be legally, morally reprehensible. He's not doing that. He's asking God to intervene. Look, verse 7, when he aims his arrows, that is when the political leaders devise their plans, when they decide on a course of action, Cause that course of action, cause that plan to be blunted, to go for naught, to fall to the wayside, to have no effect, stop its result. That's the idea. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, verse 8. Have you ever put salt on a snail or a slug? They, they, that salt absorbs all of the moisture out of the body of the, the slug and it dies of dehydration. This is a, a picture, it's a metaphor. This is what David is praying that would happen to these evil, unrepentant leaders. Pray for their repentance. Ask God to intervene. But when they continue in rebellion, when they continue to speak lies, when they continue to come against God's decrees, then they elevate themselves above God and think they are the answer. And they can command whatever they want. Then pray 
that God would stop them. That God would stop their evil intentions. Look, verse 8, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. And in our case, when we're talking about the sanctity of human life, think about all of those who have had a part in causing innocent children from the womb to be murdered and never see any light. Let these evildoers be as they have caused others to be. That's the idea. Look how fast God, or look how fast David prays for God to intervene. Verse 9, sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns. I mean, you've got a pot on the fire, and sooner than that bottom of that pot can feel the heat from those thorns, that's how swiftly, God, I'm asking you to judge these evildoers. No respite. No peace. Do it quickly. Whether it's green or ablaze, may He sweep them away. The idea there is, in some translations, the idea of grass being pulled up, being plowed up, and there be nothing left. But if you put green grass or you put dry grass under the pot, whatever brings the quickest judgment that you could dish out, God, to them, they deserve it. May it be quick. Now look at verse 10 and 11, because here we come to a little bit of hope. And I know, look, I know that these verses that we just read, it's upsetting, and you don't know how to think about it completely, but this is the Word of God to us. This is an example. This is one way that you and I can pray as Christians. And it's not an unloving way. It's not an ungracious way. This is how you pray against those who continue to rebel against God and have no desire, no intention to repent and turn from their evil ways. That will only continue to perpetuate sin upon sin upon sin. And you pray this way. God, stop them. God, stop them. And look, verse 10, the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. It's a a picture of a victory march. It's a picture of victorious soldiers walking on the battlefield and walking through all the carnage. And they're rejoicing because they won. And look, we are the righteous. That is, those of us who are true believers, we are the righteous. We will see the vengeance of the Lord. He will honor Himself. He will not share His glory with anyone. He will not let a people continue in opposition, intentional opposition against His very revealed, clearly written Word. No matter what that culture says, no matter what that culture does. Vengeance will be mine, says the Lord. Not ours. Not ours. It's His. And surely, mankind will say, surely, there is a reward for the righteous. Surely, there is a God who judges on earth. Mankind could include the people that these rulers have rule over, it could include the very, the very rulers themselves. It certainly includes those who are true believers. When we will say, we will voice this together, in the future, we will say, surely there is reward for those who are righteous. And there is a God who judges on earth. Now that's the psalm, and now we've got to make some application and say some things that need to be said, because we want to be um, gracious and we want to be kind here. We want to make sure that we understand the importance, and so uh, the importance of what we need to understand. Uh, let's recognize immediately 
that abortion is a difficult and complicated issue. And there certainly are medical necessary reasons. Again, after all medical options have been exhausted, that there would be the loss of a baby. And that happens for some women. Uh, Some women have been sinned against, and they certainly are not guilty of the sin that was done against them. But the result of that has been an abortion. And then there are other women who have chosen out of selfish reasons, out of sinful reasons, to hide their sin by abortion. And and here's what we need to understand, that in every case, no matter what the circumstances are, in every case, there would be hurt, and there would be pain, and there would be brokenness, and that shame, and the tears of those women would be real. Would be real. So we need to understand that. And secondly, we need to understand this, that just because uh, a woman in her past has chosen convenience abortion as an option for her life, she has not committed the unpardonable sin. Um, She is not worthless. She is not damaged beyond forgiveness. Uh, She is not beyond any of God's grace. Her sin is not any greater than God's grace. She is not beyond hope or the good news of the gospel. We need to understand that. We agree on that? And so what we need to help women to do who have been involved with abortion is to recognize that their shame that they have, for many of them, the shame that they have is because they have real guilt. Because that's the case of every person, male or female. We have real guilt. The real guilt of being separated from God. The real guilt of our own thoughts and words and attitudes and actions. The real guilt of being birthed, conceived in sin. We have real guilt. And and women that have the shame of an abortion will will never really get rid of their shame until they get rid of their guilt. Their real guilt. And Jesus overcomes the shame of any abortion. He overcomes the shame of any sin by removing real guilt. And here's how He did it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. See, Jesus provides the forgiveness for sin because He lived a perfect life. He fulfilled all the requirements that God demanded for the righteousness that was necessary to come into His presence. And then He willingly, Jesus willingly offered that perfect life as an atoning sacrifice on the cross, dying as a substitute for sinners who deserve to die. And those who would believe, those who would believe, are given freely that righteousness that is necessary to stand before God. Would you believe Whatever sin you've done, whatever word, whatever action, whatever motive, whatever desires, 
whatever intent, whatever actions, whatever it is, whatever it is, you're guilty until you repent. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So ladies, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Jesus provides the forgiveness for the sin. He provides the joy, the peace, the relief from your shame. Your shame for an abortion is the consequences of one sin. And he can take any shame of any sin. But there are some other things we need to think about in closing. And that is that um, we live, listen, and as Christians, we live in an unprecedented time. We live in a time in which the gospel is so accessible. And we must, we, listen, we must put before people Christ every day. Put Him before our neighbors. Put Him before our friends. Put Him before our family. We have such an opportunity. I know that it's confusing. I know it's chaotic. We don't know what's going to happen in the election year. We don't know politically. We don't know economically. I know that. I know that. That's why Christ is the answer. That's the hope. So church, I'm asking all of us to do a better job at putting Christ before the people. Because that's our only hope. Secondly, um, Listen, we've got to, the church has been so lazy, so indifferent. And, and look, would you rather have a prayer, an emotional prayer like this, or would you ha rather have somebody just fold their arms in indifference? What would you rather have? You, you want somebody who pays careful attention to the trends and all the deadly rhetoric and all the political speak, of, of, particularly of the pro-abortion movement. You realize, listen, we can't be naive. We are in a cultural war. It really is a cultural war for truth and for lies. And we, the church is in the middle of that war. And we can't be lazy. We can't be indifferent. We must stand on the truth. Uh, we cannot be fearful. We cannot be hopeless. We cannot shrink back. We cannot be lazy. We must argue and we must vote. And we must upheld the preservation of human life in every stage. I'm not talking just about the unborn, but in every stage to the moment that God causes that heart to quit. Not that we cause that heart to quit by pulling the plug or performing an abortion. We can't be ignorant. That's why I encourage you to read the National Political Party platform. Read the Republican platform, read the Democratic platform, and you decide who's going to stand for life. And even both of them, there's a lot of reservations about both of them. That's why we just got to stand ourselves. Go vote, though. Go vote. Make it a priority. And then certainly one last thing that I would say is pray. Pray that God would intervene. Pray that God would change hearts. Pray that He would have shed His mercy on a nation that's gone so far astray. I mean, pray that God would give each of us courage, conviction. Pray for the women who feel trapped. who think that the only thing that they can do is have an abortion. Pray that they would see that somebody would help, that that doesn't have to be their only option. Let's encourage adoption. Let's encourage fostering. Let's be light 
and in this world on this particular issue. And I'm happy to say that I want to read to you what's on our website. Have you looked at our website lately? You know that we are a, a house of refuge. Here's what it says. By a house of refuge, we mean that a woman who finds herself in an unplanned pregnancy can find hope, acceptance, and grace at Believers Baptist Church. Please know that being pregnant is not a sin. And the child you carry is not a punishment or mistake. You may have made a sinful decision that led to this pregnancy, or you may have even been sinned against. But we want you to know that you're loved, and we will do whatever it takes to help you in this pregnancy before and after birth. Here's what you can expect. The church family will not gossip about you, not shame you or abandon you. We want you to feel safe. And we will endeavor to protect you from hurtful words or actions which are contrary to the love of God as revealed in His Word. Here's what we will do. We will do everything in our power to remove whatever obstacles stand in the way of you having this child. There are people in this church ready to help you, care for you practically, and connect you with resources both inside and outside of the church and connect you with people both inside and outside the church. Finally, we can never support or encourage a woman to have an abortion because the child you carry is made in the image of God and is intrinsically valuable and loved by God. And if you have ever had an abortion in your past, we want you to know that an abortion is not an unforgivable sin. Whoever confesses and forsakes their sins finds mercy. If you have never gone through post-abortion counseling, we will be happy to help you so that you can walk in complete healing and freedom. That's on our website. If you know of an unplanned pregnancy or in your sphere of influence, and we can help, let's help. Let's save a baby. I'm glad that we can partner with Rafa, I'm thankful for those who counsel and help. And uh, if you would like to be involved with that, as I mentioned, Deidre and also Karen would be great resources for you to talk with about you being willing to help. My, uh, I didn't know I was going to be this emotional. I'm sorry. But I'll be in the back and... uh, I think I had to talk with you concerning salvation, concerning your real guilt, or if there's other things that we could talk about, I can talk with you. We have other counselors. We have other women that I know could be of help. So don't leave this morning without seeking some kind of help if you need that this morning. Let's pray together.